Good afternoon. So happy to see you all here today and to have on-site programs again. Um, we're really appreciative of you coming out for this. And we're also appreciative to our live um, a streaming audience. So we're uh, doing a hybrid program and we hope to do more in the future uh, to reach uh, also a broader audience. I'm Bill Harris, the acting director here. And uh, I'm, we're very excited about the program today and our guests who are old friends of the library. Um, they'll be uh, uh, in conversation about equality in the Constitution. Um, I'll just, oh, oh quickly. Um, after they are in conversation, there'll be a period of questions. And if you uh, would queue up at the microphone over there, um, everyone will be able to hear you and it'll uh, be a, a more organized process. We'd appreciate it. Um, a little background on our speakers. Uh, Kermit Roosevelt is a professor of constitutional law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Um, he's also a law clerk for uh, former Supreme Court Justice David Souter. He's an author of The Myth of Judicial Activism, um, as well as two novels, Allegiance and In the Shadow of the Law. Uh, John Barrett is a good friend of the library as well, and Kermit has actually been here uh, before and spoken, so we appreciate that. Uh, um, John is a new, one of our newest library trustees, um, and he teaches constitutional law, Criminal Procedure and Legal History at St. John's University, and um, is working on a book about Robert Jackson, so which we're all looking forward to, and we'll have you back for a program on that. So I hope you join me in welcoming them and, uh, and uh, look forward to it. Oh, and afterwards, Kermit will be signing copies of his books at the New Deal uh, Bookstore. We encourage you to stop by. Thanks. Bill, thank you so much. Uh, Kermit? Kim, welcome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here again. Um, you probably did not need to have Roosevelt as your last name to be admitted to this program, but it is. So how are you related to Franklin Roosevelt here at the Franklin Roosevelt Library? Well, so Theodore is a lot easier. I'm, I'm Theodore's great, great grandson. And, you know, I, I know that. And then the relationship to Franklin is, is pretty complicated. Um, I, I thought that Theodore and Franklin were second cousins, which I thought made me Franklin's second cousin four times removed. Um, but I've been told that's not right. So to be, to be honest, I don't know exactly what the relationship is. Right. Well, it, it, as a great, great, if I've got it right, grandson of Theodore, uh, who was the uncle of Eleanor, uh, yes. your direct claim to a relationship here is uh, closer to Eleanor, I guess. Than closer to family. Eleanor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the um, date happens to be September 17th. Here we are on Constitution Day. Uh, what does that mean? Well, Constitution Day is the day on which back in 1787, the drafters of the Constitution signed that document in Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And then, of course, so that's, that's like the fact. And then there's always the interpretive question. Um, what does it mean? What is our relation to that day and those men and that document? And that's, that's sort of what I try to explore in the book. Right. Um, the book, The Nation That Never Was, Reconstructing America's Story, uh, juxtaposes a standard story with the reconstruction story or the better story that you're urging. Uh, and I think the standard story um, really flows out of the Constitution Day anniversary and our habit of celebrating it. So first, I think it'd be helpful to sort of set the stage for the book for you to tell the standard story. Um, and it may not be news to you because I think the point of it being the standard story is it's what we're generally raised on. Uh, but if you would recap it. Yeah, so this, this shouldn't be news to you. The, the thesis of the book really is there's a way that we've thought about America and American identity and our connection to the past which used to work for us, or it looked like it was working for us in terms of bringing us together in the name of shared values and uniting us around an American identity. Um, it used to work for us, it's not working as well now, and there's a better way. And the standard story should be familiar to you. This is what politicians say when they're trying to explain American identity. Basically, the idea is it all starts with the Declaration of Independence. So actually, even before the Constitution, back in 1776, 
our founders write down these great ideals. All men are created equal is probably the central one. Um, they're endowed with inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's another one. And there at the very beginning, we have in particular this American commitment to the ideal of equality, meaning something like equality within a political community, the government should treat people equally or the government should respect everyone's interests equally. Um, and there's maybe a tension between that idea and slavery, which the standard story accounts for in, in various different ways. But the idea basically is our values are there at the beginning in the Declaration of Independence, and then they're fought for in the revolution, and then they're sort of made law in the constitution. And a lot of American development is done by 1787 or 1791 when the Bill of Rights is ratified. And what we do then is sort of progressively realize these ideals over time. But importantly, they're there at the beginning. It's a story of continuity. So it tells us we are the heirs of the signers of the Declaration of Independence and the drafters of the Constitution. And it's a success story. So we win the Revolutionary War. We replace the Articles of Confederation with the Constitution. And that's a good, happy moment, too. We prevail in the Civil War, which is costly and divisive. But the principles of the Declaration, as Abraham Lincoln says in the Gettysburg Address, lead us forward. And over and over again, Americans can sort of come together behind this value of equality stated in the Declaration and move forward together. That's so, the standard. Story. So all men are created equal is men with property and men on, on the standard story and men without. Uh, and women too, and enslaved people in slave colonies becoming states too. It just takes us decades or a century or so to sort of work it out to really complete the task. But the claim of the standard story is it's all right there in the declaration. Yeah, the claim of the standard story is that principle is deeply incompatible with the actual practice of the colonists, but they knew that and they wrote it anyway for some reason, you know, and Abraham Lincoln tries to explain this and he says it's sort of a promissory note for the future. It's an ideal that we can work towards. And Martin Luther King says the same thing in 1963. He talks about it as a promissory note um, to which every generation of Americans would fall heir. So the idea is, and it's a nice idea. I mean, if you think about it, it doesn't seem that plausible to me. But it's a nice idea that at the very beginning, people knew that they were not living up to the principles that they aspired to. And they wrote those principles down anyway and said they were self-evident truths um, in the hopes that in the future they could be fully realized. Sort of the Ten Commandments, which uh, Moses delivered and the people struggled to live up to. And at least it's a high ideal and it's all right there at the start. Right. The high ideal is there at the start. You know, American history really starts on this high note and we're sort of trying to live up to those ideals. So in a sense, you know, Thomas Jefferson shows us what we should aspire to. So let's start to take it apart. Um, the key line, all men are created equal, is really, I think, the fulcrum of the standard version and the claim. Um, if Jefferson didn't mean this high ideal and this sort of universal egalitarian view, uh, what did he mean? What was 1776 in fact about? Right. So 1776 is about independence. It's about national independence. As the Declaration says, it's about one people dissolving the political bonds that connected it to another. So if you're Jefferson and the colonies are declaring independence, what do you need to do? Well, you need to give an account of where legitimate political authority comes from and then when it can be rejected, when a people can declare their independence. And then you need to show that the colonists' situation fits that case that you've laid out. And if you read the Declaration with that in mind, it's really quite straightforward how the argument works. But what about all men are created equal? How does that fit the argument? Well, so if you think of, it from, the, if you think of it from the modern perspective, it doesn't, right? And that's why Lincoln said it was of no use in affecting our separation from Great Britain. And it was put there for future use. Um, but that seems like a very strange thing for Jefferson to be doing. You know, the patriots are thinking about independence, and if they lose the war, they will be executed. So they're probably not laying down markers for some distant future that they won't live to see if they don't succeed. They're probably pretty focused on the task at hand. And the amazing thing about all men are created equal and the Declaration 
and the scholarship about it is pretty much everyone I've read who writes about what all men are created equal meant to Jefferson understands it the way that I do. They just don't take what seems to me sort of the next obvious step in terms of its implications. So most declaration scholars will say, what is Jefferson doing in the preamble? He's setting out this account of where legitimate political authority comes from. And it's basically enlightenment social contract theory. It looks a whole lot like John Locke's second treatise of government. And enlightenment social contract theory starts out by imagining what they call the state of nature, which is a world with no government and no laws and individuals just sort of appear there, right? We're imagining that they're created because people weren't actually born into the state of nature. We're talking about not real, but hypothetical people. But if you imagine that people just came into being in a world with no government and no laws, what would their rights be and what would they do? And enlightenment social contract theory says, well, if people just came into being in a world with no government and no laws, they would all be equal. No one would have any obligation to obey anyone else. And that's what it means to say all men are created equal. Legitimate political authority doesn't come from God, basically. So that, that statement is a very compressed rejection of the divine right of kings. Because you might have said, well, people are created in the state of nature, and then God chooses someone to be a king, and they have legitimate authority. Right. All men are created equal says, no, that's not how it works. And then, of course, the declaration goes on to give you a theory of where legitimate political authority comes from, which is people have rights, but they're not secure because other individuals might take them away. You know, some other person in the state of nature might take your property or enslave you or kill you. So people band together and form governments to protect their rights. And government is sort of a mutual self-defense pact. And legitimate political authority comes from the consent of the governed. So people create governments to protect their rights those governments are legitimate because people consent to them. So the flow or the connection from all men are created equal to the rest of the declaration is there's no divine right to be George III, and these are the indignities and worse that he's perpetrating on these colonies, and we don't consent to it, and thus we embark on this revolution. Yeah, exactly. So there's no divine right to be George III. What makes his authority legitimate, and interestingly, a monarchy can be legitimate, according to the Declaration. It's not a democratic document. But what makes his authority legitimate is that there was some consent back in the past, hypothetically, I guess, and he's protecting the natural rights of his subjects. And then the Declaration goes on to show, no, he's not. He's not protecting our natural rights. He's interfering with our pursuit of happiness. He's, you know, all of these grievances. Um, he's actually transporting Hessians across the seas to kill us. And he's inciting domestic insurrections, which is to say slave rebellions. And he is um, encouraging the merciless savages, which is how the declaration refers to Native Americans, to rise up and attack us. So George is doing all of these things, and he has forfeited his authority. That's okay. the argument. So let's move forward from 1776 to the Constitution. If the declaration is to embark on this war and achieve this independence, what is the Constitution for? And is it an egalitarian achievement? Well, in some ways, the Constitution is an egalitarian achievement, I think. You know, and I, I try not to overstate my case because the Constitution has some democratic features. If you look at it, it's not that democratic in a lot of ways. There is sort of notoriously no federal constitutional right to vote. And the 1787 Constitution really doesn't do a lot in terms of overseeing the way states run their political systems. Um, but the big thing that we get wrong about the 1787 Constitution, I think, is that we think about it as a document that is concerned with the rights of individuals and the relationship between individuals. Because nowadays we think of the federal constitution that way, right? The federal constitution gives us lots of important rights that protect us against state governments trying to restrict our liberty. So the right not to have your schools segregated in Brown v. Board of Education, or the right to interracial marriage in Loving Against Virginia. We think of the federal constitution as a source of important individual rights. But in 1787, it's really not doing that. There's not a single provision in the 1787 constitution that regulates what one individual can do to another. 
And the Congress that the 1787 Constitution creates couldn't enact a law forbidding one American from killing another unless they're crossing state lines or something like that. Because the 1787 Constitution is really about interstate relations, relationships between the states, and maybe collective action problems, situations where the states have to be forced to cooperate. So you need a federal government that can do that. And foreign affairs. So the federal government is supposed to be the single voice of the United States in foreign affairs. But it's really not at all the kind of government described in the Declaration of Independence, because those governments are supposed to protect individuals from other individuals. And you don't need the federal government to do that because it's assumed that the states are doing that. So in 1787, we're leaving most issues up to the states. We're creating a federal government for limited, and I would say, geostrategic purposes. With regard to the egalitarian ideal um, in the air, I guess, um, and the Constitution as a document that addresses slavery, um, this may oversimplify two interpretive positions, but do you, do you view the Constitution, the 1787 Constitution, as a slavery perpetrating governmental creation or as uh, an empowering of a national government to, in time, get past this institution of slavery? Well, I'm glad that you asked that question. It's a very interesting question. I, I think I would say some people at the time might have thought that the national government would eventually be able to end slavery. But certainly the Southern delegates did not think that and they would not have signed a constitution that they thought contained that possibility. So if you look at the debates over and over again, there are arguments about slavery because it's an issue that divides the states. And the constitution says things about slavery, not because it cares about individual rights, not because it cares about this as a deprivation of liberty, but because it's a source of conflict between the states. And that's what the constitution is attuned to. It's trying to resolve this conflict or manage it. And it manages it generally with compromises, but the compromises tend to be on the pro-slavery side of things, I would say, because the Northern states, and there were a small number of, of free states, but the, the anti-slavery side of the discussion really wanted union. And the pro-slavery side really wanted slavery. And if that's what the sides want, you end up with union and protections for slavery. And the three-fifths compromise, which is sort of notorious, and the protection of the international slave trade until 1808, and the fugitive slave clause, all of these things tilt the national government in favor of slavery. What about citizenship? Um, it's insufficient to just say except for slavery, but uh, as to the rest of the people in the landmass at the time, is the Constitution a citizenship egalitarian document? Uh, well, so I think it's not, again, um, you know, and, and now we do think of it that way um, because we think if you're born here, you're a citizen, and as a citizen, you have rights and you're a federal citizen because you're born here, and that gives you state citizenship, so you're also a member of the state political community. None of that exists with the 1787 Constitution. Congress has the power to create uniform laws for immigration and naturalization, so there's some idea that people can become citizens of the United States, but it's not ever really explained what that means or what its relationship to state citizenship is. And in 1787, a lot of people probably thought that their state citizenship was primary. And what it means to be a citizen of the United States is just to be a citizen of one of the United States. So that um, if you think of the United States as the name of a collection of states, this makes sense. Um, so if you're a citizen of Massachusetts, then by virtue of the fact that you're a citizen of Massachusetts, which is one of the United States, you're a citizen of the United States. And state citizenship actually leads you to federal citizenship. Now, it turned out, according to the Supreme Court, that that wasn't true in one very important context, because even in 1787, free blacks were citizens of several states, and free blacks participated in some of the ratifying conventions. But the Supreme Court says in 1857 in the Dred Scott decision, no matter what states want, 
So even if Massachusetts includes black citizens, they can't be United States citizens. So by introducing Dred Scott and taking us into the 19th century, you're really starting to unfold the alternative story, uh, the alternative to the standard version. Um, I, I begin by asking how you count in this history. Um, have we had just one constitution or have we had more than one? Is Constitution Day about 2022 and some number that we're at today? Um, what's your statistic? And I, I, I raise this because I heard a, a discussion at the National Constitution Center earlier this week where one of the speakers said, unlike lots of countries, we've only had one constitution. Yeah, well, so that, that drives me crazy to hear that. I thought it might. As does, as does the thing that people say, our constitution has been a great success and served us well for over 200 years. Um, and there are sort of slightly different reasons that I think those two things. Um, let me talk about the success first. So look at the 1787 constitution. What is it supposed to do? Well, the preamble tells you um, we're trying to form a more perfect union and we're trying to ensure domestic tranquility um, and provide for the common defense. And certainly the Civil War where Americans kill three quarters of a million Americans um, has to be counted a failure there. You know, do we form a more perfect union? Well, no, either 11 or 13 states secede depending on what you think about Missouri and Kentucky. Um, do we ensure domestic tranquility? No, we have war. So I don't understand how people can say the constitution has been a great success when you know, 80 years in it cataclysmically fails in its stated goals. Um, but then the other point is we certainly haven't had just one constitution because the changes that are made to the constitution after the civil war with the reconstruction amendments, the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments are so massive that for all intents and purposes in its substance, it's a new constitution. It trusts the federal government. It distrusts the states. So the model that's built into the 1787 constitution is really the revolutionary war where the national government, King George is behaving tyrannically and the states defend liberty. The model that's built into the reconstruction constitution of course is the opposite. The states are the oppressors. The federal government is defending liberty. So there's an enormous change there. There is something astonishing and striking in the treatment of slavery. Um, and emancipation and claims based on slavery, which maybe we can talk about in a second. Um, and then there's the process by which the 14th Amendment is ratified, which I also think we just don't pay enough attention to. So I'll stop now maybe just by well, saying, okay. in terms of substance, two different constitutions. Right. Uh, let's take each of those subparts. I think they're extremely important. Uh, first, unfold the slavery point, and then we'll come to the 14th Amendment ratification. Okay, so the slavery point, the Civil War starts out as a war for the status quo, I think, on both sides. That's how I describe it. So the secessionist states have their view of what they're due under the 1787 Constitution, which they understood as a document that protected slavery and basically ensured that the federal government would never try to interfere. And now they think they're not getting what they're due because the Republican Party is taking over the federal government and the Republican Party is anti-slavery. So they're seceding, arguing for the rights that they thought they should have had. And interestingly, the Confederate Constitution that they write is very similar to the US Constitution. It's basically just their interpretation of the US Constitution. And they don't repudiate the US Constitution. Um, they don't even repudiate the Declaration of Independence. They celebrate July 4th. They say that they are declaring independence based on the principles of the patriots of the Revolutionary War. Um, on Lincoln's side, it's also a war for the status quo, and he has a slightly different understanding of it, but he's trying to restore the union at the beginning. And he says this repeatedly, um, that he's not trying to end slavery. He just wants to bring the states back together. But then, um, sometime around the beginning of 1863, I guess, and I would say sometime between the preliminary and the final Emancipation Proclamation. Right, fall of 1862, maybe, in, into 63. Yeah, um, it changes. And with the Emancipation Proclamation, we're committed to something else and we're gonna end slavery. And we're gonna have a new birth of freedom, Lincoln says in the Gettysburg Address. So now the war has a different objective. It's what I call a regime change 
revolution, where the idea is the existing regime is unjust and it must be swept away. And slavery is the center of that. So we're going to get rid of slavery. But the big question that I think you have to ask then is what regime is associated with slavery, right? Is it just the Confederacy or is it more broadly founding America? So in 1776, every state recognizes slavery. In the 1787 constitution, it's recognized and protected in various ways. In the Civil War, there are several slave states fighting on Lincoln's side. Um, slavery in the District of Columbia is not abolished until 1862. So my suggestion is that when the nation turns against slavery and decides we're gonna get rid of this, we're gonna abolish this regime, it's not just the Confederacy that we should think, them, think of them as overthrowing, it's actually founding America more broadly. Um, and you can see this, I think, very dramatically in the 14th Amendment, which sort of tries to link slavery and the Confederacy, I guess. But it says, no claims based on rebel debt shall be honored, right? We're repudiating debts incurred by the Confederacy because they were never a legitimate government. And we're very different from them going forward. Obviously, we're not the Confederacy. And then in the very same sentence, it says the same thing about emancipation. Claims based on emancipation are illegal, which is a very strange thing to say. And maybe it doesn't seem strange because it's obviously right. And obviously, we repudiate the laws of the Confederacy. But again, it's not just the Confederacy. It's the laws of Maryland. It's the laws of Delaware. It's the laws of... Um, a lot of northern states going up you know, into the 19th century. <clears throat> so what's happening there, you know, when we're saying we're sort of we're rejecting claims based on slavery, they're as invalid as claims based on rebel debt. I think we're rejecting founding America in the same way. And then there's the third point, which I could talk about, I guess, about the way that the 14th Amendment is ratified. Well, um, I think that flows right out of this. So please do that. And then I want to get the alternative to the standard version that this amounts to. Okay. So this is, I think, something that's really amazing that we just don't teach in our history classes, how the 14th amendment was actually ratified because- Do you teach it to your students? I do in, in constitutional law. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. do too. And they are shocked in law school to, to learn this because they have not learned it earlier is my experience. Yeah. So- after the Civil War, it's clear, obviously, slavery is over. Congress proposes the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment is ratified by the former Confederate states. And they accept that slavery is over in principle, but they try to reinstate slavery in practice with overtly discriminatory laws called the Black Codes that bind the formerly enslaved to particular jobs in a way that looks a whole lot like slavery. And Congress is unwilling to accept this, the Reconstruction Congress. So the Reconstruction Congress enacts Civil Rights Acts that, among other things, provide for birthright citizenship. So the formerly enslaved will be citizens of these states, um, and they will have federal rights by virtue of that citizenship. But it's unclear that this is even constitutional because the Supreme Court in Dred Scott said that black people can't be citizens of the United States. And it's possible, you know, if you enact a law, a later Congress can repeal it. So Congress decides we need to put this in the Constitution and entrench it against future change or judicial challenge. So they draft the 14th Amendment, which, among other things, codifies the Civil Rights Act. They send it out to the states. Tennessee accepts it, but every other Confederate state rejects it. And by 1867, it's clear you will not get three quarters of the states ratifying the 14th Amendment. It's dead. There's no way to change the Constitution in the way that the Reconstruction Congress is trying to do. Or at least no way within the existing system, because what the Reconstruction Congress does then is this shocking thing. It enacts the Reconstruction Act and it annihilates the Southern states. It says no legitimate governments exist in these states. They're not states anymore. They're military districts and we're putting them under military control. So it wipes out the state governments and then it builds new governments. And I'm saying the way that I think of this now is it's building new states too. So first it says, here is your political community. It includes the formerly enslaved, which was a thing that the former Confederates were completely unwilling to do. 
your new political community, the formerly enslaved are citizens. That's what the birthright citizenship does. Um, and it creates a new political structure. So it says to these political communities, draft new constitutions. But in voting for the delegates to these constitutional conventions that you're gonna have, the formerly enslaved are guaranteed the right to participate, the former Confederates are not. So we have a new political community, we have a different distribution of power within that community. Then we get the new reconstruction constitutions, the states ratify the 14th Amendment, they're allowed back into the Union, but they're not, I think, the same states that seceded, and they're not even the same states that ratified the 13th Amendment, they're new states. And I believe that the ratification of the 14th Amendment by these new states, just like the ratification of the Constitution by the 13 states um, in the 18th century, creates a new nation. And so this is why I think we got another constitution, the Reconstruction Constitution, and an, another America. So now you've seen both halves of Professor Roosevelt's book title, The Nation That Never Was is the Founders, 1776, Jefferson, All Men Are Created Equal, uh, Hoorah, From the Beginning story, and Reconstructing America's story is this focus on the post-Civil War, uh, 19th century, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment story. Um, since it was accomplished at the point of a bayonet, in effect, um, why is that a story to celebrate? Well, it is accomplished at the point of a bayonet. Um, but one of the lessons, I think, is that sometimes that's what you need. So I think it's very interesting to compare sort of the legitimating principles of the founding government and the reconstruction government. And what it, what it takes for a government to be legitimate according to the Declaration of Independence is consent, which like you never actually have. So ideally in enlightenment social contract theory, every person would actually consent to form a government, but that doesn't happen in practice. What are you gonna do? You're born into a society. Do you leave if you don't consent and just like leave your country? So there's no real consent. Um, and then the other one is protection of natural rights. But it turns out that what people mean by that is protection of the natural rights of insiders. So it's okay actually to enslave outsiders according to this theory. And this idea of protection of the natural rights of insiders turns out, if you look at what the Supreme Court does with it, it turns out to mean the government can't redistribute. The government can't take from one person and give to another, which ends up meaning the government can't try to promote equality. So are those great legitimating principles? I think they're not. And I, I do a little bit of sort of historical surveys of where these arguments pop up and what they do. It's not that inspiring, honestly. Um, so then compare the Civil War and Reconstruction. One thing that we're saying is slavery must be abolished and we're gonna do it by force if we have to because it's the right thing to do, because this is justice. And yeah, I believe that you can found a government on justice. The problem of course is different people disagree about what is just. And so you need some method of legitimating it going forward that ensures you're not just pursuing some narrow idiosyncratic vision of justice that really means you're oppressing lots of people. And how do you do that? Well, the answer is something that's missing from the declaration, which is democracy. So if going forward, you have a political system that tries to give every person's interest equal weight so this idea of equal concern and respect, which is kind of what we now think of with all men are created equal. And you do that by trying to give each person equal voice in the political process, then I think you can be pretty confident that you're creating a just society. So founding America, I think the legitimating principles are consent of the governed, protection of the natural rights of insiders, reconstruction America, democracy and justice. And I like those a lot better. So that's why I think it's inspiring. So is Constitution Day uh, sometime around 1868 properly understood, or is it after the 19th Amendment was ratified that brought women into political participation? Is it uh, the 26th Amendment that allowed 18-year-olds to vote, or is it just uh, a forward-moving process? Well, so I do think it's a forward-moving process. So, you know, one of the things that the standard story does is it says, we started out with a sort of narrow conception of who we the people are, and we've gradually expanded it. And I think that's a nice story. I don't think there's any founding ideal that really does that. 
But I do think that there are reconstruction ideals that do that, that have this expansive force. I think that democracy and equality are ideas that naturally spread because you ask yourself, who should be allowed to participate in the political process? Who deserves equal treatment? And as time goes on, social movements change what people think about that and eventually Supreme Court decisions reflect those. So I would say our America, Reconstruction America, the moment that corresponds to 1776 with the articulation of the principles is 1863, probably with the Gettysburg Address, the Emancipation Proclamation, also good. And then the moment that corresponds to 1787, the ratification of the Constitution, is probably 1868, the ratification of the 14th Amendment. And then we do have fulfillment of these ideals over time. Right. And I do, you know, I don't want to say that Reconstruction is perfect. Um, because in, it's flawed in a lot of ways, um, you know, and even the people who are most pro-equality still often have quite racist attitudes and there's a lot of sexism, but there are these principles that you can more fully realize over time, which I think is a good aspect of the standard story. It's just not really true about the founder. So who needs to do a better job of telling this story, the reconstructed story. You mentioned the Supreme Court. They may be a part of it, but I look around the country. Let's start in the nation's capital, and there's the Washington Monument, and there's the Jefferson Memorial. I go to Broadway, and there's Hamilton. I go to AP US history classes, and I know from my kids what the standard story is that's taught there. Um, so how do we reconstruct our story? Well, of the people that you mentioned, I feel like the best entry point is AP US history. So I've been trying to talk to teachers and I've talked to high school teachers and I've talked at high schools um, because I think that if we start shifting our focus, you know, modestly at first, but with the new generation, we can bring this along. So it's, it's a lot more difficult to change the minds of older people whose worldviews are relatively entrenched. Um, and I don't think that you could go out there and say, let's get rid of the Washington Monument. You could maybe close, you could come close to getting rid of the Jefferson Memorial pretty soon, I think. Um, I feel like people are turning against Jefferson a bit, um, justifiably so, I think. The, be the best part of the tidal basin is, of course, the FDR Memorial yes. on the other side of right. the water. Um, but I think this is a, a change that would take or generations. Or maybe Martin Luther King. So Th you have those to, two over Jefferson. You have to start by teaching the children differently. The... Um, Supreme Court, uh, a topic that we both teach and study, uh, is a part of this landscape. I, I just want a couple of minutes of this before we turn to questions. Um, how is the Supreme Court doing in understanding what our nation's story is? And more broadly, how is the Supreme Court doing in its functionality? And is this a time to start thinking differently about the Supreme Court? Well, it depends on how you, how you used to think about the Supreme Court. Um, and different people are at different stages in this progress, I think. But for a lot of people, our understanding of the Supreme Court was really shaped by the Warren Court and decisions that we feel good about, like Brown v. Board of Education and Loving against Virginia. And we think of the Supreme Court as a defender of American ideals and an institution that advances those ideals even. And what we need to understand is that that was a historical anomaly, I think. And the Supreme Court does a good job sort of moving the nation forward. Sometimes if it's facing down some minority of states and national popular opinion is behind it. Um, and that happened during the civil rights movement and the Warren Court era, but it otherwise has been pretty rare. And it's more common for the Supreme Court to be a small C conservative force where it sort of represents the political consensus of 15 or 20 years ago and sort of slows down progressive movements um, or just to protect powerful interests um, because it's not a surprise that government can get captured by powerful interests and people drawn from the ranks of elite lawyers sympathize with the elite. So what the Supreme Court is doing now, I think is really engaging in a project of rolling back Warren Court jurisprudence and Possibly the best to understand this, although it's a little bit pessimistic and alarming, um, is to say that American history goes through cycles 
And we have equality movements that make gains and then we have a backlash against them. And the starkest example of this really is reconstruction where we have enormous strides towards equality in lots of different areas, but then we have a backlash. So there's the compromise of 1877 and federal troops and their military supervision of the South and the reconstruction governments that had been operating integrated schools and police forces and had been providing free medical care um, and social services on a scale never before seen in the South are overthrown by violence. And most of the gains of reconstruction get swept away and you get segregation and Jim Crow and the more or less total eradication of black voting rights in the South. So enormous backlash, um, the period that's called redemption. The Warren court era, the civil rights era, people often call the second reconstruction because they're sort of trying to advance the values of the first reconstruction and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 most crucially brings back the promise of the 15th amendment. So that maybe now again, we can have a functioning multiracial democracy. But again, there's a backlash, which I would say starts about 1980 mm -hmm. with the election of Ronald Reagan and the elevation of originalism, which really focuses on 1776 and not 1868. Um, the elevation of originalism as a philosophy of constitutional interpretation. And I think that we're now sort of in the period of the second redemption. And you can kind of see the Supreme Court helping that along, which it sort of did with the first redemption too, um, with decisions like Shelby County, where the Supreme Court invalidates parts of the Voting Rights Act, and I think is not a defender of democracy. So I'm, I'm quite disappointed in the Supreme Court. I, I don't want the word redemption to sail past too quickly because it sounds like a positive thing. Redemption is the backlash or the ending of reconstruction. It's, it's Confederacy redemption or it's yes. slaveocracy redemption. Right. It's, it's the redemption of the South and the people who were doing that thought it was a good thing, um, but it's not a good thing. Right. You served on President Biden's court reform commission in 2021 which considered ideas for legislative and perhaps constitutional um, measures to address the Supreme Court's move uh, in a redemptionist direction, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, what do you take away from that process? And is court reform something that should be part of our agenda today? I think court reform should absolutely be part of our agenda. Um, I think there's one really obvious fix that if we survive long enough, we'll fix things. Um, and then there's one emergency measure that we should seriously consider because it's not clear we have the luxury of time. So the longer term one is term limits. And if we arranged Supreme Court service so that each justice would have a period of active service deciding the regular cases of 18 years, and we staggered those terms so that each president could appoint two justices per four-year terms, I think we'd dramatically improve the situation and the functioning of the court. Um, and we would avoid some of the conflicts that arise, unnecessary conflicts, I think, between the court and the political branches, where the court, because of a fluke of appointments, ends up radically out of step with mainstream American constitutional thought. So, Term limits is a long-term solution. I think most people agree it would be good. There's pretty strong bipartisan support for that. Um, but the problem with that is it would take a while to have effect. And so if you think that the Supreme Court is now facilitating an undermining of our democracy, then you might think we need something more extreme that will take effect sooner, which would be court expansion. Um, and this is, of course, an appropriate place to talk about court packing, I think. Um, but what I would say about that is, one, the reason that FDR needed to consider court packing was the lack of term limits. So he goes his entire first term without getting an appointment. Um, if he'd had two appointments in a rational system, the kind of conflict that you see over the New Deal wouldn't have happened. But 
FDR was considering court packing because the court was sort of out of step with the country and it was preventing really important substantive laws that were designed to respond to a national emergency. I think the situation is worse now because my concern is about democracy. It's not about particular substantive policies. It's not about recognizing particular rights or refusing to recognize particular rights or the authority of the Environmental Protection Agency. You know, I disagree with the Supreme Court on a lot of those decisions, but I wouldn't say we should expand the court as a remedy for that. I think you could have term limits and let it work its way through slowly. Um, but I am quite worried about the effects on democracy of several Supreme Court decisions and the independent state legislature theory, which they've teed up, um, has the potential to really damage our ability to govern ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I know that this has been fantastic and there's so much more to discuss about the book. Um, I'll pause and invite audience questions. If anyone has a question they'd like to ask, the microphone is in the aisle on the left side and, and, and please come up. Uh, yeah. I don't so much have a question, um, except as an old Brit and a new citizen. And at this time when I'm really praying that new King Charles is gonna make some radical changes in the stock system over there, I just wanted to say how welcome what you're saying is to, to, to me as an outsider who you know, loves this country, it's been really kind to me. Um, but it's agony just to see what you're talking about, which is you know, where is democracy within it and where are the ethics in it? Um, and, you know, and how much time do we have? We've been fighting, I've been fighting for the environment for 40 years, thinking that once we knew what we're doing, we'd change, but no. So how much time and that extra pressure that's putting on the system is scary. And I just bow to you for questioning all of this. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel much the same way. I, you know, I think with climate change and with democracy, um, you keep thinking that people will wake up and see what's happening and that surely we'll do something and surely people will take it seriously. Um, and then it's, it's quite scary for me to see, um, and I, on the Biden Supreme Court Reform Commission, I saw this uh, because people were saying, well, you know, we shouldn't tinker with this brilliant constitution we have and we shouldn't make people think that you can make structural changes to the Supreme Court by statute because if we delegitimize the Supreme Court, it won't be able to protect democracy the way that it always does. Um, and my response to that was, that is not what's happening. I, do, I don't know how you can look at the court and think the court is gonna save us, so we should protect its institutional legitimacy. The court is not gonna save us. This question is from Sally on Facebook and really follows up on that. Uh, does all of this really amount to uh, a discussion of institutional racism from which this country has um, always been dealing and is unable to extricate itself? Well, it definitely connects to that. So one way of thinking about what the book is trying to do is to give us a story of an America that we can believe in, that we can be proud of. Because the problem with the standard story, and I think I started this out by saying that the standard story isn't working anymore. The problem with the standard story is that as people have worked to make it more accurate over the past years, it's become less inspiring. And I sort of hinted at this with Jefferson, right? Jefferson enslaved his own children. And it's a little bit hard to hold him up as an exemplar of American ideals. And it's a little bit hard when you learn more about the slavery and the systemic racism and the deeply entrenched white supremacy of founding America to look back and say, there is a time when we really had great ideals that we should try to live up to now. It's sort of alienating, I think, particularly for younger people. Um, and one response to that is to try to mandate the standard story and prop it up by law, which is what the anti-CRT bills around the country are doing. So in Florida, they say, you must teach American history as the development 
of a nation based on the universal principles of the Declaration of Independence, which I think is just wrong as an interpretation of the Declaration of Independence. They're finding the wrong principles in there. So my book is banned in Florida. But <laughs> the, the bigger point is I don't think you can do that by law because the people who are defending the standard story have really lost the culture war. And unless you're gonna end up with a really totalitarian state controlling what people think and say, you can't make, you can't go back on that. But my argument is there is an America that we can believe in and it has really all of the desirable features of the standard story. So it's born in a war for liberty. Now, a little bit hard to say that about the revolution when during the revolution, the British were freeing enslaved people and the Americans were demanding the right to re-enslave them. And then in the Treaty of Paris, they insist that the British depart without carrying away any Negroes or other property of the colonists. Um, just not that inspiring. But the Civil War, that's inspiring. So you can say, here's our short statement of ideals, right? It's the Gettysburg Address, not the Declaration of Independence. And here's the war for those ideals. It's the Civil War, not the Revolution. And here's the Constitution that makes them law. It's the Reconstruction Constitution, not the 1787 Constitution. And this is an America that we can be proud of. And this is a story that we can really believe. Uh, question here. Yes, hi, my name is Alyssa. I'm actually a civil rights attorney and I practice mainly in the area of police misconduct. Um, so I deal with section 1983 a lot. Um, a lot of people don't know section 1983 is actually the first part of the Civil Rights Act of 1871. And as I listen to you speak here today, I sort of have seen us touch on it a little, but I guess I'm curious what your opinion is on what the effect of being able to bring a civil action to ensure constitutional rights and how that plays into your thesis about the changing constitution um, and what our story should be about it. Well, I think section 1983 actions are very important. I mean, I think that is a demonstration of the reconstruction constitution's commitment to individual rights. So the interesting thing about individual rights in the constitution is I said in the 1787 constitution, you really have almost none. With the Bill of Rights, you get some individual rights against the federal government, but the federal government isn't gonna be interfering with your rights that much because it's really concerned with interstate and international relations. And you got nothing protecting you from the states really, and nothing protecting you from other individuals. And then with reconstruction, you actually get the federal government stepping into the role of protecting individuals from other individuals, right? It does that when it wipes out the Southern governments. Now federal military protection is the only protection for your rights. So there we were really doing it. And then they sort of back off that, um, but you do end up with federal rights against the states. So now you've got protection for individual rights against state governments and the state governments are the ones who interfere with your individual rights because you interact with them a lot more. And so section 1983 lets you enforce those individual rights against um, deprivations under color of state law, which I think is great and important and shows a change between the reconstruction constitution and the founding constitution. Um, and of course, consistent with what I was saying about the second redemption, you can see the current Supreme Court cutting back on that. Thank you. I wanna build on her question and ask a little bit about legislative or other government activities. I'm interested, ramping into that, about your statement that the, the culture war has been won, that the egalitarian constitution and the younger generation perhaps um, just sees what this country is and where it needs to go. Uh, but that's not 100 to zero. It might not even be 60-40. Um, and so for people who fly Confederate flags, uh, et cetera, et cetera, what can government be doing to build on the real American story, our constitutional story? Right. Well, it's, it's, so it's definitely not 100 to zero. Um, is it 60-40? Maybe? I don't know. I mean, my, my main point is for, the, for a story to work, you probably need more than 60-40 for a story to be able to unify us. And we're like, this story tells us what America is and what we stand for. You need a lot of people to buy into that. So even if it were 60-40 in favor of the standard story, that would be a problem because you'd have this big dissident movement saying this is not an accurate story. 
Um, and I think that at the level of the younger generations, um, you know, based on my kids' education, which I guess is not necessarily representative, but you know, I have a 15 year old, I have a 10 year old and what I sense, and you see it online too, I guess, um, is that they're just not buying the standard story at all. Um, so a significant portion of the country, at least um, in the younger generation, is not willing to go along with this traditional founding fathers venerated ideals story, uh, which means we need something new. Now, how do we do that? So the people with Confederate flags on their pickup trucks, if they're old enough to drive, I think, you know, they're out of the prime window where we can affect their understanding of what America is and their place in it. So, you know, really, I, I do want to start younger. Um, it's hard to reach people who are older, but I like to think that there's some potential there. And, you know, I, I like to try to think that there can be common ground. Um, and with the Confederate flag, you know, I, not sure exactly what to say. I, sometimes I would say, you know, well, Confederate America does have a lot in common with founding America. So you can be proud of yourself as a real American in a sense, um, but we're not that America anymore and we should try to move on from that. Sir, a question. My question is, the pernicious independent state legislature theory propounded by the out of balance Supreme Court is frightening. And because under the current congressional majorities and this administration, we haven't managed to put a remedy in place, what shall we do beyond working very, very hard to, man to maintain these majorities, to maintain these slender majorities so that some remedy can be applied? What, if we don't maintain the majorities, what other remedy can there be? to Sam Alito's leading us into the dissolution of, 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 of the world we think we live in. Why don't you step back and explain the independent state legislature theory, and then if you've got an answer, that would be heartening to all of us. Right. Well, uh, I'm not sure I do. But so the independent state legislature theory, I said before, the 1787 Constitution is not as democratic as you might think. And one of the ways that it's not as democratic as you might think is, you know, of course, even now, right, you don't vote for president. You vote for an elector and your elector is pledged to a particular candidate and your elector will vote for that candidate. So you vote through the electoral college, which distorts the popular vote in some ways. But, um, I, you know, I guess we could all live with it. I mean, I favor the national popular vote compact, which is an attempt to get around the electoral college. But maybe we could all live with that. However, you don't even have a right to vote for an elector because what the constitution says is each state shall appoint a certain number of electors in such manner as the legislature shall direct. So the legislature doesn't have to let you have a popular vote for the electors. The legislature could just pick who it wants the electors to be. And that's true, right? That's in the constitution. Pretty much everyone agrees with that. But then some people build out from that and they say, well, the legislature is supposed to have control over this, meaning, so it's not plausible, I think, that a state legislature would say, we're just not going to have a popular vote, we're going to decide. But what is plausible, maybe, is the state holds the election and it doesn't go the way the legislature wants. And the legislature says, oh, no, you know, something went wrong. We think there was fraud. There's lots of uncertainties. We need to investigate. And they do their investigation They're like, ah, the election was compromised. You know what? I don't think we can redo this. We're just going to award our electors to the candidate that we think deserves them. Um, and I think that's a crazy reading of the Constitution, but that's sort of the strong version of the independent state legislature theory. And if that's accepted by the Supreme Court, of course, it transfers ultimate power over a state's electoral votes away from the people of the state and to the legislature, and hey, the legislatures are representative, so I guess it doesn't matter, except that they're gerrymandered. So in a lot of states, the state legislatures are very gerrymandered, and Democrats do this too when they can, but the Republicans have done it a lot more successfully. So 
if you really accept the independent state legislature theory and you give power to the gerrymandered legislatures of Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Wisconsin, suddenly swing states go reliably Republican. Um, so it's got a very strong partisan tilt to it and, and to, an anti-democratic one. And to further raise your alarm, in the late 2020 litigation, four Supreme Court justices indicated general support for a version of this theory. And the Supreme Court is hearing a case in the coming term, which will be an occasion to develop this theory. Uh, one final question, which is a, a version of the Civil War question. This comes from Sally on Facebook. Uh, are we living in a modern day version of Union versus Confederacy? Well, yes, I think we are. I mean, we're living in a modern day version of Reconstruction versus Redemption. This is Reconstruction versus Redemption round two. And so, you know, what I'm arguing for is either don't abandon the second reconstruction or we need a third reconstruction, depending on how you frame it. And it's, it's really interesting. These go in almost 100 year cycles. So I guess it would be more plausible to say don't abandon the second reconstruction the way we gave up on the first. Um, or, you know, in another 40 years, I guess we could say it's time for a third reconstruction. Uh, our time has flown past. Um, I will say as a final thought, um, you should really read the book. Uh, Professor Roosevelt, as you've seen, is, is a brilliant and thoroughly uh, expert scholar and teacher. Uh, and he's also just a gorgeous writer. Uh, and then once you've read the book, uh, it becomes your story. It becomes our story and it becomes a shared teaching responsibility. Um, I do think that's our hope and you're doing it very well. Uh, please join me in thanking Professor Kermit Roosevelt. There will be books available, and he will be signing them out in the lobby. Thank you all. It was really fun. Thanks.